Hi, this is Tom Lucher again. This week we speak about a very old drug and that is aspirin, which comes from the willow bark and even the Romans knew about it. But uh, on uh, July 10, uh, 1763, uh, the Reverend Stone reported at the Royal uh, Society in London on his successes with uh, willow bark in patients with fever. And as such, it became a fever remedy. And, uh, but this wasn't aspirin yet. But on August 10th, uh, 19, uh, 1898, uh, the, the chemist uh, Felix Hoffmann actually uh, produced in his laboratory, as you can see in this lab book, for the first time, aspirin. And it became really the blockbuster of all times by fire, uh, Bayer ph Pharmaceutical. And uh, initially they said, as you can see in this advertisement, it should not be used in patients with heart disease, as uh, you see down below. And so initially it was just a fever remedy for, for the Spanish flu and any other flu uh, uh, over decades, until in the 60s, Sir John Wayne did some seminal experiments where he actually showed that platelets, as you can see here, uh, can of course aggregate. Uh, we knew that and then they form the clots. But aspirin blocks this uh, by interfering with a very specific enzyme. And eventually for that he got the Nobel Prize in the 80s uh, uh, in addition to his work for prostaglandins. And so today we know that this complex interaction between the coagulation cascade starting with tissue factor on the right then forming uh, fibrin, interfering with platelets that are uh, activated, uh, eventually forming a solid clot. Aspirin is involved uh, uh, very importantly and inhibits specifically uh, thromboxane by acetylating uh, uh, the uh, enzyme leading to its formation, cyclooxygenase 1 in particular. So what does it really do in patients? Well, <clears throat> there was a hype curve, uh, as you can see. Initially, we were using it for every everybody and everybody uh, swallowed it. If I asked once uh, at the symposium, uh, physicians who takes aspirin, uh, if we did it uh, anonymously, most of them took aspirin in an, uh, an attempt to, to live longer, to uh, prevent stroke and myocardial infarction. But today, uh, we know that this is not so easy. In fact, there are three trials. Uh, the ARRIVE trial, where I was involved uh, in the events at Education Committee, showed no effect whatsoever in patients uh, at, at mild risk for cardiovascular disease. Uh, then uh, there was uh, another trial uh, in the middle with diabetics, where you can see that in a sense that uh, in fact, there was a little effect on outcome with aspirin compared to placebo, but there was more bleeding. So overall, the balance was really neutral. And eventually, it was also uh, uh, looked at in the elderly on the right. And there also, there was a little uh, minute effect on outcomes, but uh, more bleeding. And so essentially, I think at this point in time, aspirin really cannot be uh, recommended in primary prevention. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't work under other conditions. This is a seminal trial from the 80s by Peter Slide, published in The Lancet. And you can see this is aspirin and streptokinase in patients with acute STEMI, as we would say, call it today. And you can see that there is a significant 10% almost reduction in mortality by aspirin as, it, uh, as with streptokinase. So platelets and the coagulation are additive if inhibited. So aspirin has a place in acute myocardial infarction, no doubt. Now what dose should we use after myocardial infarction? That's just a very recent trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at the low and medium 325 milligram dose of aspirin and concluded there is no difference. So we can take 80 or 100 milligrams of aspirin on the roll conditions and we have the same effects and possibly a bit less bleeding, although this wasn't dramatic. So overall we can say in secondary prevention, uh, if we had a stent, an ACS, we would recommend aspirin forever.
and initially up to three, six or 12 months, depending on the clinical situation, we combine it with a uh, P2Y12 uh, uh, inhibitor, be it clopidogrel, prasugrel, or ticragloror. But uh, with that, uh, we are not giving this uh, long term. So in patients at high bleeding risk, maybe one or th three months, in those with low bleeding risk, maybe a, a year, particularly in those with an acute event, and in those with very low bleeding risk, but in a high ischemic risk, maybe even longer. Now in stroke, we know that aspirin does not work to prevent uh, stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation or a PFO. So we shouldn't recommend it there. So we, there we would recommend NOAX in particular. And if the patient has a very high bleeding risk, of course, mechanical devices such as LA occluders or PFO occluders could be considered. In TIA and stroke as such, uh, aspirin is recommended in secondary prevention. So it's a very old drug, long journey from a fever drug to a, a cardiac drug. And now, again, restricted to secondary prevention. In primary prevention, other uh, things work better. Your lifestyle, that you're responsible for it, and possibly a statin or an anti-diabetic drug if you suffer from these conditions. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this little history lesson this afternoon. Bye-bye.